right, everyone. Welcome. Can we all stand to our feet? If you're in the lobby, please make your way into the sanctuary. We can, contrary to popular belief, I think we can fit almost everyone in here. So we, if we need to squeeze in, we could squeeze in. Let's close the doors. We can. Are you guys ready to worship? I said, are you ready to worship? I just believe that what has started this afternoon, what started this morning and last night, we are just going to see a culmination of it all tonight. It's just, God's going to, it's going to be God's finale tonight, I believe. Amen. Let's lift our hands to heaven. Let's, let's close our eyes. Nobody looking around. Jesus, you are everything. You are everything, God. There is nothing, there is nobody outside of you. You alone are king. You alone are Lord. You alone are righteous. Tonight we have come, Jesus, because we love your presence. We desire a greater encounter. We desire a greater measure of your presence, an increase of your presence. Come, Lord Jesus, tonight. Fill every heart and fill every mind. We want to see your glory. encourage you guys tonight when you close your eyes don't let your mind wander but look at the face of Jesus and intentionally look at his face let everything that he is permeate you forget about everything else forget about everyone else and ask him for a greater measure ask him for a greater measure ask him for an increase of his glory ask him for an increase of his presence the tangibility of who he is. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come like a flood and like a mighty rushing wind. Invade tonight, Jesus, I pray. Invade. Invade. In Jesus' name.
Come on, lift your own song to Him. Sing out to Jesus. Sing out to Him. Come on, lift it, lift it, lift it. We are asking tonight that you come be the flame that burns everything else away. That you come be the flame that burns everything else away. There's nothing else we want. David found a secret, Psalms 23, when he said, The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want there is nothing that you could want or need when he is your shepherd we worship and serve the great shepherd we worship the greatest king we serve the greatest God filled with all power filled with all glory filled with all majesty there is no one that can sit before him. There is nothing that can stand in his presence. He alone is worthy. He alone is all powerful. He alone is all righteous. Father, give us a glimpse. Give us a glimpse of your power tonight, Lord. Give us, if we could have just a glimpse, Jesus, of your fullness. Just a glimpse of how big and how sovereign just a glimpse of how all-knowing you are. It would change everything. So Jesus, we lay everything. I said we lay everything. You guys agree with me. Pray with me. We leave everything at your feet. We hold nothing back. Jesus, we don't want the effects of your presence. We don't want the residual of when you come. We just want you, Jesus. Whatever that looks like, whatever that means, if you heal me or you don't heal me, if I'm delivered or I'm not delivered, I want you, Jesus.
Come on, declare it. Declare it over your life. Declare it over your children. Declare it over your family. Come on, prophetically declare it. vision. You are my purpose. You are my plan. You are my goal. 
You are my accomplishment, my vision, my dreams. It's all wrapped up in your majesty. And so tonight we've come to lay everything. We hold nothing back. We lay everything at your feet. And we say, burn it all. Burn it all, God. Make us a pure people before you that can truly say, beholding the Lord in all of his glory as in a mirror. When Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. This is what we desire. So whatever it takes, God, burn it all away. But we want to see your glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Can we give a loud shout to Jesus? Come on. Hallelujah. Lord bless you. You may be seated. quickly find our seats. I want to continue in this uh, atmosphere of worship, and we're going to give really quick, and then I'm going to bring Pastor William up, but if I can get the ushers to get the buckets ready, we're going to pray <clears throat> over the offerings, we're going to pray over the gifts, and then we'll bring Pastor William up, but how many of you, how many of you love to give? Yeah. That's a decent response. We'll work on it. How many of you know that giving is, is not just to pay bills? How many of you know giving is not just to pay payroll and to keep the lights on? Giving is our worship. It's, it's a part of our worship. And how many of you have been blessed by habitation so far? Wow. We had an, an incredible prayer room this afternoon. But if habitations, um, if these habitation conferences have blessed you in any way, we want to expand them. Amen? We want to keep going. Uh, expand them into different cities and states. And we need the help of partners and givers. Amen? That can make this possible. Because none of this is possible if we don't partner together. So if you want to partner with Habitation Ministries, you can go on the Church Center app and click on the Habitation tab and you can set up recurring giving. Um, and we are, I know Pastor William and the team is, is building plans and making plans to expand and do more habitations across the country. Amen? And we wanna sow into what God is doing. I said we wanna sow into what God is doing. There is a mighty, mighty harvest coming. I don't think any of us realize the harvest that is coming. Deuteronomy 16, the Lord said to Moses, make sure the Feast of Tabernacles, he said, make sure no one comes to the house of the Lord empty-handed. Let me remember when, when God said that. He said, make sure in Deuteronomy 16, make sure no one comes into the house of the Lord empty-handed. So to God, it's not about how much, it's not about anything else, but our heart posture. Proverbs says that God looks at the intents and the hearts of a man. Amen. So it's about the heart and obedience. So if I could just encourage you tonight to just be obedient and have a heart that is open and have hands that are open and willing and come into the house of the Lord with something to offer and not just something to take. Amen? Is that okay to say? If you've come with a quarter, but that is all that you have and that's with the fullness of your heart and that you bring that to the Lord with joyful giving, then God looks at that as if you gave a million dollars. I don't care if it's a quarter or a million dollars. It does. It makes no difference to God. What matters to God is obedience. And what matters to God is that we honor his house. Amen? Amen. So lift it. If you have a check or cash, I want you to just lift it high. 
if you're giving on your phone, just lift your hands. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless every gift tonight, Father. We bless every giver, Lord. We pray that these gifts would be a sweet aroma to you. We pray that they would be a sweet sacrifice, God, that is well-pleasing to you. In these gifts, Father, these offerings, it is our way of saying you are worthy, that we wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for you, Jesus that you are all we need and all we desire. Everything we have is from you, and so we give you back what's yours. We give you back what's yours. Let our life be wrapped up in this gift tonight, and we lay it down on the altar before you. We ask that you bless these gifts, God. Bless these givers. Bless every person that has come in this building, every person that has watched online. I thank you, Lord, that lives are being transformed and have been transformed in Jesus' name. Bless each giver and every household. Bless their families and their businesses, Father, I pray. In Jesus' name, we lay everything at your feet, and we ask that you be pleased with our hearts tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. So just go ahead and give. And as, you, as you're finished giving, if you could just stand to your feet, I just want to do something real quick. we just stretch our hands towards Pastor William and Pastor Emily? Jesus, I thank you for these gifts. I thank you for these vessels. Thank you for the obedience to the call. The diligence, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that they have served you unashamed, completely devoted, no matter what it costs. And I thank you, Father, that you will strengthen them in this season. I thank you, Lord, that as the ministry grows and as everything is growing around them, God, and as you are taking them into new places physically and spiritually, God, I thank you, Lord, that the anointing would continue to increase, God in ways that they could never even thought or imagine, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that your presence continue to increase, that the amount and the preciseness in which you speak to them would continue to increase. I thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness. I thank you, Father, for their pioneering spirit. I thank you, Lord, for my brother, Father, that even when I was lost, that when I was cold, God, that you used him to light a fire in my heart, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that as he speaks tonight, that fire come out of his mouth, I thank you, Lord, that as he speaks tonight, you fill him, that it would not be his words, but yours, God, that lives would be changed, that every mind and heart would be renewed. Thank you for these leaders. We are so grateful for them, God. We ask that you use them in greater ways, God, in this season than all the past seasons combined. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Can we welcome Pastor William? Amen. Can we honor Pastor Costi, please? He had to do that before I preach. Does anybody have a seat next to them? Raise your hand. Can we bring in overflow? Fill those first. And as we do that, um, if you are, let's do 27 and under, and you want to come sit at the front, come join us so that we can bring in overflow. You want to go older? Should we go older than 27? 31. No, 31, that's my age, so you can come sit on the front. Come on, I'm proud of you, way to be bold, way to be bold. Come on, Anna Doss. I want to get everybody in here, so come on. Sitting on the ground for three hours, it doesn't hurt that bad. And 
I did want to say just as they're coming in, um, and if our ushers could just help fill some of these chairs that now are available. All right, that's good. I think we're good. Thanks, guys. Well, all right, yeah. Um, our next habitation that we're going to be doing, I believe it's the next one, right? Tennessee will be the next one. So uh, as of now. Um, but we're going to be doing a, ha- a habitation in Franklin, Tennessee, August 11th and 12th. We feel like the Lord is calling us uh, to that area as a community. Uh, we don't know exactly what he's calling us to. We just know that he's calling us to something. And we know the best way to do that is to do this there. Um, we have some amazing people coming. Uh, I don't know if any of you know David Wagner. Um, and uh, I was trying to think who else. Well, of course, Corey will be there. He's at everything. Uh, I need to hear his haze everywhere I go. Um, and uh, Tiffany Hudson, actually, from Elevation Worship will be with us. It's going to be super fun. So here's what we're going to do. So I think it's just today, tonight, and then tomorrow. Um, you can register at habitationministries.org. As a church family, as a nation, let's just convoy there. What do you say? Let's just bring this there and light sparks all over the country, okay? So thank you for sewing, but I, it's $25, I think, tonight and tomorrow only, and then it goes up from there. Um, obviously, that's gonna be a much more expensive one. Um, but register, come be a part, amen? All right, why don't you close your eyes? What are you doing, Micah? He's having a drink. <laughs> Play that thing. <laughs> Come on, close your eyes. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Ask him to come. Ask him to come. We bless your name, Lord. We worship. We give you all. We.
Every voice, every voice. You Jesus, Jesus. Stretch your hands towards the worship team. Stretch your hands towards that. Keep singing it. Sing it again. We give you all. We give you all. We give you all. Thank you, Father. Fill them, God, with your presence. Fill them fresh, Lord. Thank you for raising up worshipers, Lord. Raise up worshipers, God. Come on, sing it, every voice. Raise up worshipers, Lord. We give you all, we give you all.
going through it again. Every voice, we give you all. We of the Lord all the days of our life and behold his beauty this was the desire of the lamb John 17 he said father I desire there's nowhere else you see Jesus saying this he says I desire that they be with me where I am and they behold my glory above all else God we desire to be where you are to look at you in the eye until we become like you. We recognize your presence. We honor your presence for being among us in this room. And we ask you to please stay. May your cloud remain, God, and not just corporately here. But God, may it be the shadow that covers every individual within the sound of my voice. May everything change tonight. You're precious, Jesus. We're in love with you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Thanks, guys. We won't be able to stop if you keep playing, so just stop. Thanks. I told them they have to sit up there because at any moment's notice, this whole thing could just break out, you know? <laughs> so I feel like it's going to get messy before the end of the night. Um, so just don't be in a rush, all right? Let's not be in a rush. I'm never in a rush, obviously, <laughs> clearly. Um, tonight, I, the Lord put a, a word in my heart that um, many of you, especially that are part of this community here, uh, have definitely heard, I think in many ways, I brought about three of them together. So it should be about four hours. And um, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, but I just believe it's so important for this time. Usually at these, I get into Psalms 132, but you know, I, I said, Lord, what, what are you saying now? What is, what is it that our generation, God, desperately needs and our generation has an identity crisis. And for far too long, we've allowed false humility to rob the bride of who God's called her to be. And there's no house for him if there's no family in it. There's no habitation unless you realize that you are God's everlasting habitation. God doesn't dwell in buildings. He was like, I'm sick of boxes. I'm sick of having to be moved in the mountains. I want to go inside of you and find rest. That's unbelievable to me. And we quote the scriptures, Christ in us is the hope of glory, but we don't really believe it because we don't look like fully like Christ yet. And that word glory means confident expectation. Christ in me is the confident expectation that the glory of the Lord will reside upon my life. And the Lord, back in August, we... Uh, <clears throat> We started seeing the Lord break out in amazing ways here. And back in August, when we were kind of in the height of, we started doing prayer rooms in June, the Lord began to move like crazy. Um, 
Can I have a tissue so I'm not wiping my snot on my shirt all night? Um, just give me the whole box, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> but back in June, the Lord began to move and to break out. And we just started gathering here like every day, almost. And our kids would sleep here. It was a whole thing. Not overnight, just during the day, because we didn't let them sleep at night because we got them up early. And I remember this constant question was ringing in my mind of what is the message for this generation? And it kind of came out of, I had heard Bob Jones, a prophecy or no, a vision that he had had where he said he was on like a small pony, and I'm probably going to butcher it in some way, but I know the context, so just stick with me. He was on a small pony, and he's riding down this street on it, and there's, there's crowds, massive crowds in, in stands on both sides of him. And there's dogs with rabies, like on the sidelines, I guess you could say, that were trying to get to where Bob Jones was and bite the horse. And God spoke to him in the vision and said, this pony is the message to your generation. And if you, don't, if you don't preach the message to your generation, the dogs will come and kill it. It says a little leaven, it just leavens the whole lump. And I've watched for so long a generation get close and get close and get close to truly stepping into Christ in us is the hope of glory and one way or another, religion sets boundaries that says, you can't say that. And what I believe God's raising in this hour is he's raising up some courageous, bold people that are not gonna fall for the false humility trap and be like, you know, I, I shared it a, a couple weeks ago here that if you throw crabs together in boiling water, when one tries to get out, they pull each other down. If the crab is alone, it easily gets out of the water. But for far too long, we have allowed religion to constantly pull us down and set up these boundaries that someone generations prior told me I had to follow. Even though the scriptures say that as he is, so are we in heaven? No, good job. As he is, so are we in this world. And I'm tired of praying for the sick and not seeing the sick healed. I'm tired of preaching the kingdom not accompanied with miracle signs and wonders. And we got to get honest with ourselves and our generation, throw our schedules out, throw all our planning out. And I, and I love churches. We prayed for pastors and I did it as a disclaimer in many ways. So I want you to hear my heart tonight. I am not bashing the bride. I love the bride. We're trying to find her. Okay. And sometimes when you're trying to find something, you're throwing things around your house Especially when it's valuable. You don't really care about the couch cushions when the wedding ring, well, the women's wedding ring, because ours is like 100 bucks, but <laughs> is underneath the couch. You don't care. You're ripping everything apart, trying to find that which is valuable. A man found treasure in a field, and he sold all that he had to buy the whole field because he probably thought there was more treasure in the field. And so I just can't help but feel like we need this violent, aggressive pursuit to hit our hearts of going, Lord, you ascended. You didn't stay here. Like he, he didn't stay physically in the flesh on the earth for a reason. And if you weren't paying attention, it might have looked like he lost. I mean, he stands up inside of a synagogue and starts quoting the book of Isaiah that I've come to heal the brokenhearted, to mend them. And he, and he makes all of these profound statements about healing and it's the, the year of the Lord's favor. And he dies and, and raises from the dead and ascends. And there's still people that are oppressed. There's still people that are sick. There's still people that are bound. And sometimes I think to myself, Lord, why didn't you just stay why did not you just build like the most amazing house in the entire world? You imagine the synagogue size he would have had? The ministry, Jesus Christ International Ministries would be unbelievable. There'd be two billion donors. It would be incredible. But he didn't do any of that. He said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go sit at the right hand of the Father and I'm gonna intercede on your behalf. Here's what that means. Actually, I'm gonna do it through you. See, we don't. <laughs> K 
consider this, that he could have stayed. He could have had the biggest ministry on the earth. He could have, if he wanted to, to see everybody healed. But he said, I refuse to have a plan that doesn't include you. I'm not trying to get your claps. I want something to awaken in our hearts because for far too long, we just go from conference to conference and God have mercy on us if we just put on another conference and say, I got some goosebumps and some tears fell down my face. The pastor touched me and I fell out and I came up exactly the same. I was still depressed. I was still discouraged because I never came into the revelation that Christ in me is the hope of glory. And I have need of nothing. He is my only need. He's my only want. He's my only desire. And when a generation comes into that, religion could say anything they want to me. But just like the children of Israel, I was born for the other side of the river. And I'm tired of playing it safe on the wrong side. Don't say this. Don't say this. God have mercy on us. As long as it's in the Bible, we say whatever we want. Because I'm telling you, when I look at these young people, I've been watching. There's, I don't know who you are, but there's like these two young girls that are like right here going crazy. William Lentz is filming. He said, I can't concentrate. He said that in my ear. He said, I can't concentrate. I'm watching the way that these young girls, I mean, I'm talking, I don't know, they got to be eight years old. And they're going after the presence of God. Some of the older ones, no offense, I'm part of that. You know, sometimes we're just kind of like, and the young kids are going crazy, losing their minds, and, and the innocence and the purity, and then they grow up and we teach them about death and bills. Just make it through life, stay out of hell. One day you'll go to heaven. And we're building a tower of Babel still, reaching, trying to get to heaven, and God is about to demolish all of it in Jesus' name. And we need, we need, synagogues to turn into temples, places for God. So in August, the Lord starts asking me this question, what is the message to your generation? So I was kind of like, Lord, why does this keep coming up in my mind? And so, of course, I said what, you know, you should say and always say, I said, Jesus, you, it's you, you are the message. There's no other message. We don't, I mean, just Jesus, 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 because it's, it's true. It's very true, and it's very safe. It's a very safe answer. And, uh, and I hear the Lord yell at me. Scott is my witness. It was midnight. I'll never forget it because Pastor Gerardo texted me right after and confirmed it. It was midnight. I couldn't sleep, and I was awake with this question running through my mind of what is the message to your generation? And so I said, you, and I hear the Lord yell at me, the lamb and the lamb's wife. And I said, here's what the religious, the, the religiosity came out of me, you know? No, Jesus, it's not about us. This is all about you, right? That's, I mean, that's true, yeah, it's all, and he responded with this, don't despise my cross. If you weren't a part, listen to the Father's message and desire, I wouldn't have died. This is what I heard. I would have stayed here. I would have set up a physical kingdom, but I ascended to intercede for you, for you to carry what I started until I come for my kingdom. To separate, listen, Christ from his bride is to insult the cross and dishonor the Father's purpose. You have to understand that Jesus didn't die for Jesus. He was perfect. He was sinless. Jesus died because the Father said, there's more that are just like you. And I need you to tell them that they are just like you. Come on. See, I can feel the religion in the room, even though we just quoted, as he is, so are we in this world. I'm not just like him. I, sometimes I get corrected because naturally I just sing like, there's no one like you. And then the Lord's like, what are you talking about? Stop singing unbiblical songs. Right, But here's what we have in church, and we create it by these Christianese messages that we just say because everybody else says it, yeah. right? We, we, we just 
do things because everybody else does it, but what is your conviction? Not what the YouTube preacher said, but what did God say to you? What is it that you believe? And so what we have today is we have, you know, Paul said it like this. We have tens and thousands of teachers, few fathers, right? That's amazing. I would also say we have tens and thousands of mistresses, few wives. And here's, here's what mistresses do. They want the intimacy, they want the benefits, but they don't want to carry his name. They don't want to carry the weight of having to build a family with you. They don't want to deal with the, the poopy diapers. I mean, I don't really want to deal with poopy diapers either, sometimes, most of the time, but, but we want him for what we can get from him rather than saying, Lord, I want to bear your name. I don't just want your benefits. I want your life upon my life. Eric smashed it this morning. I want the life of Christ residing in me, and I don't just want the intimacy without having the responsibility to be as you are in the earth. Are you guys with me? He's looking for a bride. And the lamb and the lamb's wife, this whole thing is a story about a lamb and his wife. The father said, I want you to go, we see it in the book of Hosea, go marry a prostitute. How? What, what do you, and, then he, and then he goes and he finds her and she continues to be a prostitute in the book of Hosea. He says, here's what we'll do. We'll allure her in the, into the wilderness with kindness. I mean, this is unbelievable to me. He took, a, he took a prostitute and he turned her into a bride. And today we come into buildings, we worship, well, I think it's too sacred to say we worship. We sing songs, horizontal, but the Lord is, there's a transition that's taking place. And there's a message that God is, I believe, from what he spoke to me, is wanting to release that you can't separate yourself from the cross. And by saying just these things that everybody else says, we write ourselves out of the story because it feels holy and it feels right. But Jesus didn't die for Jesus. Jesus died for you. And so if he died for me, the gospel includes my life. I, I, I don't want to be a leader that Matthew 22, here's the context. Matthew 22, there's a wedding feast that's about to take place. And, and the wedding feast is ready. Everyone say it's ready. The wedding's ready. And the, the, the guests, some don't respond. And the ones that do respond that they just pulled off the streets, they come in, but they don't have the right garments on. They come in and they're at the right place at the right time, but they're not wearing the attire that is fit for a wedding. And the Lord casts them out of the wedding. Our duty as leaders is not just to have conferences. Our duty is to put the right garment on you. Our duty is, is that you don't just show up on that day saying, look at all these things we've done in your name. And he can look at you and say, but I don't know who you are. I can have somebody come up to me and say, look at all these things I've done for you and act like they've known me for a year, but until they're actually in my household, until they actually bear my name. And so what we have is, is we have a lot of sincerity. We've got a lot of zeal. We've got a lot of passion. We've got a lot of hunger, and I love the hunger. I love that even on our Sunday morning church We've never told anybody to line up. They just line up. And we're like, have some coffee and hang out in the lobby. And they just refuse. One of our pastors one time, this is like my favorite story, went to one of them and was like, um, you know, you, can, you guys can hang out and fellowship and have coffee. And she goes, easy for you to say, you got a seat. And, <laughs> and uh, she said, I'm hungry. I came hungry today. So I love, I love this community. <laughs> so much. You guys are wild. You're insane. And I love it. And it's what we've dreamed of. Amen. But, but you can have passion. You can have zeal. You can have desire. But without truth, you're no different than the Pharisees. The, the Pharisees were a zealous group of people. I mean, Saul, before he was Paul, was a zealous, sincere person who thought he was doing the right thing. But sincerity without truth isn't anything, it's just noise, right? And so we got a lot of noise, and it sounds good, and it gives me goosebumps, but he said not just to worship him in spirit, but in truth as well. 
Psalms 110, just write these down. I would really encourage you to take notes tonight. Psalms 110.3, it says, your people will freely offer themselves. They will volunteer in the day of your power. We, we quote that all the time, and you've heard it before. In the day of his power, we will sign up as volunteers, and we shout. But you gotta read the rest of the verse. It says, in holy garments. We will volunteer in the day of his power, but we have to be wearing the right thing. It's not just sincere, it has to be truth. Everyone go to Numbers 32. Again, I know that this is a little bit different for a habitation, and sometimes we just want the zapping, and, and I think the zapping will still come, but what we need is, is we need truth, because my goal is that you leave different, that you leave actually more like Jesus. Amen? Okay. So Numbers 32, let's start in verse 1. It's the Old Testament. Yeah, we like it. We love it. It's just as important as the new. Jesus is the volume of the book. Amen? Amen. Numbers 32, start in verse 1. It says, Now the people of Reuben and the people of Gad had a very great number of livestock. And they saw the land of Jazir and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a good place for livestock. So the people of Gad and the people of Reuben came and said, to Moses and Eliezer, the priest, and to the chiefs of the congregation, and all these names that I will pronounce incorrectly, verse four, the land, the land that the Lord struck down before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock. And your servants have livestock. So they're, they're, they're saying this on the wrong side of the Jordan, right? That, you're, that we've got livestock, and it just makes reasonable Sense It makes a logical sense because this is a good land for livestock and we have livestock that they say, do not take us across the Jordan. Verse six, but Moses said to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, shall your brothers go to war while you sit here? He says, why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land that the Lord God has given them? Your fathers did this when I sent them to the new land to spy it out. Now listen, remember when, when they sent them to go look and you only had two. You had the, the young generation that was like, we can do this. Like we can conquer this land, but the rest of them were like, we'll never do this. We're like grasshoppers, right? And so he's reminding them, he's, he's reminding a new generation, your fathers talked like this, right? So here's the concept. Here's the context is, is that they are, this, this is the next generation. This is, they are ready. They are at the Jordan. They've come to this place. The old generation has died off and a new one is standing there, but there's still this leaven within the whole congregation that's saying, we wanna do something logical and reasonable. And I'm sorry, no one that's ever impacted history said, let's just make a reasonable decision. Nobody that's ever had an effect on the earth has been like, let's do it, it's logical. Let's, let's, and that's, and, and in a way, that's how we've approached God predominantly in the Western church is we've made this about being academic in our thinking rather than it actually causing our heart to explode, right? And so then you get to the book of Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy is basically Moses standing in front of the next generation. He's about to die Joshua's taking over, and the whole book of Deuteronomy, just, just read it on your own time, but the whole book of Deuteronomy is amazing. It is basically Moses standing before this new generation, giving them instruction and giving them history. And, he, and he's telling this new generation, now you gotta understand something about this new generation. They didn't grow up in Egypt. They had no understanding of Egypt. They didn't remember bondage. They didn't remember being beaten. They didn't remember working. They didn't remember the striving. What their upbringing was like, now imagine being a three-year-old and your first memory is you're walking through an ocean. The first thing you remember is the sea split open and you're just walking on dry ground. You get to the other side and every day there's manna from heaven. And, and, you're, and you, you didn't have a store to go to for clothes so your, your socks and shoes grew on your feet. Like this was, their, this was what they understood. Your clothes for 40 years didn't wither away. Like imagine my little Benji, his little Spider-Man shirt 
grew into an adult Spider-Man shirt. And he's just repping it for 40 years. That's my oldest's dream. He's, he shows up to church in Spider-Man slides. And one sock's on, one is off. And, and we're just doing our best to stay alive. So keep the kids alive. Throw them in the car. We'll be fine. Throw some food in there. I'm sure there's socks on the floor. There's always socks and shoes in our car. Well, her car, my car, I don't even let that happen. So anyway. Um, <laughs> but I want you to understand these, these young, these, this next generation, this is their thinking. This is what, this is the only thing they've ever known is, is they were born in miracles. Like they were born in wilderness is, is great. Water comes out of a rock. There's always food. Our clothes don't even wither on our body. But the ones that still had Egypt in their mind, all they talked about was going back to bondage. So the Lord had to wait until all of the old memories, the old mindsets, they loved their bondage. They, they, they didn't realize it in the moment, but then you, you taste freedom and you realize you loved the chains, right? And so the Lord takes them out and because they're stubborn in their thinking and he called them stiff-necked people, because they were stiff-necked, he just walked them in a circle for 40 years. I mean, it's unbelievable when you look at the, the actual map of the circle. Like, they could have just gone straight and made it there in 40 days. But for 40 years, they go in cycles because of their thinking. And I'm sorry, what I have watched, I've, I feel like in many ways, I know I'm young, but I have seen a lot. And, and what I've watched is from generation to generation, we just do and repeat the same thing over and over and over. And we say the same stuff, we just dress different. And, and even with our dress, we start looking like the 70s again. And it's just like this constant cycle over and over. Before you know it, we're gonna be in the 80s again. God have mercy. And, and I wasn't alive in the 80s, but I just don't like the way it looks. And so... But, but, I mean, let's be honest. You watch history repeat itself over and over, and everybody just follows along. Yeah, I'm gonna look like the 70s guy now. And a month ago, the 90s was, everything was big. Now everything's tight, and you can't figure out who you are. And everybody's got an identity crisis, and everybody's just following the person in front of them. And kids are suicidal and depressed, and they're 12. I was amazed the first time I preached at our youth group. I did a call for suicidal thoughts and 70% of the room responded. We need a moment like Jacob with Rachel when she's birthing her last baby. And she wants to name the child Benoni, which means son of sorrow, because she's dying and she's trying to pass it to the next generation like a crab pulling them down in their sorrow. And it says, Jacob stood up like a, no, he stood up as a father and said, his name will not be Benoni, but his name will be Benjamin, son of favor and power. And he changes the trajectory of his son's life with one, with one word out of his mouth. And we need fathers and mothers, not just repeating themselves over and over again, but telling the next generation, don't listen to the boundaries religion told you you had to follow. You were born for the other side of the river. So Deuteronomy, he's standing in front of this new generation. And I love it in Deuteronomy 4, this, this always gets me. He says, this is Moses talking to them. He says to them, who has known a God that is this close to you? And he starts reminding them of the miracles they grew up with. He says, don't forget what your eyes have seen. In Deuteronomy 4, this is a father talking. And guard your heart so that your eyes don't look away. Look how I have led you, delivered you, and protected you. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, it's the famous line in, in Judaism. This is like the centerpiece of their religion. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. This is what Mike preached uh, last night. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk with and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise listen that word listen is not just simply hear but respond to what you're hearing 
When you look it up in the Hebrew, love is not just simply emotion, but a decision to be devoted. And that word one is to keep them from all the options that they're about to have in the new land. Moses knows that this new land they're about to enter is fruitful, and usually what's fruitful has idols attached to it. When the, when the church was at, well, we weren't a church. We were just at Cafe Mila. Anyone in this building was at, who was at Cafe Mila? Come on, come on, Abby. They're, they're all here, and Joel. Um, <laughs> it wasn't hard to stay pure because there was six of us. Everybody knew what everybody was doing. It's like my household, extended household. Like, there's no, there's no behind the back talking because my dad is like, everyone comes to the table and everybody knows everybody's business. And he's very, he makes sure there's, I mean, there, and there's no feelings in our, you don't get to have feelings. You just, you just have to be okay with, with everything that's going on in your life. Your every brother and sister knows everything. And so there's no gossip because there's nothing to hide. My dad makes sure of it. We come to the table. He said, and you believe, you believe your brother did this? can't believe it. I don't know what's wrong with him. <laughs> but what's fruitful, it's as it grows, the temptation comes. It's as you go from Cafe Mila to now you have a conference and there's people here and there's influence and there's all this stuff. There's options now to turn away from the simplicity of the one thing that was just at Cafe Mila. The $50 speakers. The, I mean, I think our whole, our whole audio system was 50 bucks. And then the other half was from Pastor Rick at Calvary Christian Center. I love Pastor Rick. What an amazing man. But Moses knew that they're about to be blessed. And he's telling this new generation, be mindful of the many options. Make sure you know that your Lord is one. Joshua 5, after they crossed over, it says, so now you get to the book of Joshua. Moses is dead. He's sharing this the instruction to the new generation. Deuteronomy 32 is probably one of my, just write it down, it's probably one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. He starts singing a song. And Moses is singing this song and he says, how I I wanted you to ride in the heights of the heavens and drink honey from the rock. He's singing that over the generation that that is dying off and leaving and he's telling a new generation, in other words, I'm inspiring you. Stake, set your mind on things above and drink from the rock only. So you get to Joshua 5. They finally have crossed over chapters 1 through 5 in Joshua. And after they cross, it says, on, on the day after Passover. So we know that Passover represents the cross, right? We know that, that Passover represents the crucifixion of Christ on that amazing, glorious day. And Immediately, it says, after the day of Passover, immediately the manna stopped falling and the land began to produce for them. Here's the picture. The finished work of the cross, now it's time to believe it. Immediately, the day after Passover, immediately the next day, they didn't have manna from heaven anymore. They had to believe that where they walked, the ground would produce for them. Immediately after the day of Passover, they had to walk believing the work is finished and it's time to step into the inheritance that's been promised to us for 40 years. And here's what I watch today. It's like we say we believe in the finished work, but we're still begging for the manna from heaven. And God is like, my father and I have made our home in your heart. I didn't, I tell you in the book, I mean, even going back to the book of Joshua, that everywhere your foot steps, I will give you as an inheritance. But false humility has robbed the church into thinking that, oh, woe is me. But true humility is agreement with God's perspective. So what is God's perspective? That I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is New Testament scripture now. So what's the point? After everything this generation's seen, after all of the the miracles, the signs, the wonders, there's still this little leaven that is being ruled by their own agendas, saying reasonable things like we have livestock and this land is good for life. Let us stay on the wrong side. Let us 
Let us stay here because this seems fruitful. And I love it because the Jordan River, it says that it was overflowing. Its banks are overflowing. They're carrying hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of an ark and the Lord's like, cross it. Banks overflowing and the new generation's like, we got it. Remember when we were three and we saw the whole ocean split open? Think the Jordan's gonna be fine. And there's nowhere in there he tells them it's gonna open for them. He says, step into it. And they step into it and it opens up and then he tells them, now take 12 stones and put it in there so the next generation can see the courage of one that said, I'm gonna change the trajectory of a whole, whole generation, right? Now go to Romans 5. Romans 5. Uh, my desire is that, again, that you don't leave just saying, wow, that was, that was a good vibe. I don't know what, what would you guys say these days. That was uber anointed, man. I, 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 I want people to leave thinking differently. Because as a man thinks, so will he be. So if you think you're a disgusting, horrible, dirty sinner that religion told you you are, guess what? You're going to sin. But the more you believe that you're a son of the living God, that I have been transformed out of the, the conveyed out of the system, the kingdom of darkness, and have been brought into the, the newness of life in the kingdom of light of the dear son of Jesus, the more that I'm going to walk right. Right? Okay, so, so Romans 5. We, I want to... I want to change this. I want some of you to take a ring and a robe tonight. I want some of you to put that thing on and start believing what God says about you, that you are the habitation of God. And you're not at just some event called habitation to say we did something. We didn't build God anything if we didn't build you. We built God nothing if we didn't do God's desire. His desire was not to stay. His desire was to make his home in your heart. And, and if we weren't paying attention, like I said, we would have think he lost until you get, begin to realize that the gospel is, I'm going to do it through you. And for too long, somewhere along the way, they told me, I can't say that. The definition of insanity is do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So you get to Romans 5. Listen to this, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained also, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance and endurance character and character produces hope and the hope that does not bring us to shame because God's love has been poured into, everyone say into, our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given it, been given to us. For while we were still weak and at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Jump to verse eight, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Since therefore we have now, now, everyone say now, been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now we are reconciled. Shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God that our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Listen to this. This is the passion. It says in verse one, our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. And he now declares us flawless in his eyes. This is 5, 16 through 17, the passion. And this free flowing gift imparts to us much more than that which was given to us through the one who sinned. For because of one's transgression, we all are facing a death sentence with a verdict of guilty. But this gracious gift leaves us free from our many failures and brings us into the perfect righteousness of God, absolutely canceling out with the words, not guilty. Death once held us in its grip, and by the, the the sin of one man, death reigned as king over humanity. But now, everyone say, but now, 
how much more are we held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings in this life, enjoying our regal freedom through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Calling yourself a sinner is easy because it gives you an excuse to sin. You know, like, but when you marry God, you take on his name, you're not looking for how you can commit adultery. You know, like, this is my amazing wife, Emily, and I don't walk around every time I see a female going, oh, no. And if I did, that would be a huge problem, right? But I don't walk around trying not to sin. I actually... Thank you, Jesus. Don't even think about adultery. Uh, you, you're blinded by the fact that you're in love. And before you're married, your eyes, man, they're wondering because you're looking for it, right? But after you get married, your eyes change because your mind changed. Your mind fell in love with somebody and you became connected to them and you don't have to work hard to stay righteous. It's the love that you have that drives you to just remain in the gift that she was to you. Right, but we have this, we've got this, this mingling of, of law and grace and we gotta make sure it's balanced and we say, well, we don't get too extreme grace, but grace is outrageously extreme. And, and, and I think what people are preaching of like, you can just you know, do whatever you want and call it grace. That's not grace and it's great. It's, grace is too holy to even put into that statement because you're preaching some demonic doctrine that has nothing to do with grace. But true grace is I was dirty and now I am clean. And now I have the power. It means, the di- listen, the divine influence upon the heart and now the direct reflection of that life. That's what grace is. It's not unmerited favor. That's what the scriptures say. But the actual word means, or not what the scriptures say, that's what we That's what the translator said in the scriptures, but the actual meaning in the Greek is divine influence upon the heart. And it doesn't stop there. It starts with, it actually ends with, and I'm going to continue out to walk that divine influence. It's by his grace that you don't desire anything else. It's by his grace that you continue to grow in your love for him. But as a man thinks, so will he be. And I'm watching people that are battling, am I I dirty? Or am I clean? And we're unstable in all of our ways and we're fighting depression and fighting suicidal thoughts and fighting anxiety and fighting sickness. And I think the Lord is in heaven going, when is a generation gonna cross over? So stuck on the bondage of Egypt, so stuck on what was, so stuck on, they're not only stuck in what was, they believe they still are that thing. And they're just waiting to die and go to heaven and, and John 17 says that this is eternal life that we may know him. What are you waiting on? There is an eternal life available in the revelation of knowing God. How many of you believe you can know God on the earth? Then you can know an eternal life. You can know a life eternal that eclipses everything else in your life while your feet are planted on the earth. And I want to get there and I don't want to shrink back, the scriptures say. First John 3, 2 says that if, the, the, um, the diaglot translation says, if reality were to break through right now, we would see him as he is and we would look just like him. That's unbelievable. Go to Galatians 1. Eric touched on it. And we're going to keep just hitting on it. Galatians chapter 1. I love this. Paul Paul makes this statement right off the bat in verse 1 of chapter 1. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or through men. So he's writing this to a bunch of men, and he's saying, I didn't get this from any of you. He's making it clear, I do not fear you in any way, shape, or form because he's about to rebuke them. And so he makes it clear, I'm an apostle. (laughs) That's what Paul said. An apostle, not from men. You imagine if a leader got up today. I think if Paul came and preached today, he'd be kicked out of churches, in my opinion. (laughs) Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with him. Jump to verse six. So now he's, He's 
He's telling them who he is, and he goes, I'm astonished that you so quickly desert are deserting him who called you in grace, the grace of Christ, and are turning to a different gospel. Not, not that there is any other gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is contrary to the one we preached, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. What an astonishing statement that if Gabriel himself, the angel, if Michael, the archangel, showed up in your bedroom and started telling you you're some disgusting sinner, he says it's a fake gospel. If an angel shows up to you and speaks to you and you don't see it in the words, say, sorry, you can leave now. Verse 10, for I am not seeking the approval of man or, of, or am I speaking at seeking of God or am I trying to please man? I love it. Paul is intense. If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of God. Verse 11, for I, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. That sounds arrogant. This man didn't struggle with false humility. He wasn't like, can I give you some feedback, brother? (laughs) He's telling a generation, stay away from a fake gospel. This is, go to to chapter three really quick. Let's just read some. He starts getting even more intense. They put an exclamation point here. Verse one, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit and now you think that you can be perfected by the flesh? This is, this is the passion of what I just read in verse one. I am shocked over how quickly you have strayed away from the one who called you in the grace of Christ. I am astounded that you now embrace a distorted gospel. That is a fake gospel that is simply not true. There is only one gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, yet you have allowed those who mingle law with grace to confuse you. That's a powerful statement. I'm obviously not trying to flatter you or water down my message to be popular with men. But my supreme passion is to please God. For if all I attempt to do is please people, I would fail to be a true servant of Christ. Beloved ones, let me repeat myself clearly that the gospel is entrusted to me, that was entrusted to me, was not given to me by any man. The fake gospel, listen to this, is the one that mingles law and grace. It's the one that tries to get you to think we can say righteousness is a gift, but then you start adding a little self-effort to it. Then you start adding this working of, okay, I got to, I got to behave and be a good boy, and the gospel isn't behave. We heard it, we heard it this morning. It's die. It's, it's Colossians 3, my life is hidden in Christ with God. It's the Galatians 2, I was crucified with Christ, 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but the life I now live in the flesh. Everyone say in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I heard a pastor say it like this, for too long we have preached the conditional, unconditional love of God. And we've created a theology that although his grace was a gift, we now have to earn it, putting, putting us into performance. We think that, you know, surely we, we have to live a way that, that you know, is, is pleasing to people. And so many are hungry, so many are zealous for God, and I don't think that that's the problem. We have conference about having more zeal, and, and we've got enough zeal There's tons of movements that create hunger for the Lord, but listen, but often hunger with just enough legalism will cause you to struggle every day of your life wondering if you measure up. It's a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. And the truth is, 
is you don't need to mingle law with grace because the pure, listen, and true experience of grace is not trying to see what you can get away with. The true pursuit is how deep can I go into him? How far can I discover? It's the, it's the Romans 8 of, of no height, depth, principality, power, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And it starts out by saying, I am convinced. What I hear a lot about is stay convicted. Conviction, listen, conviction is good, but conviction is attached to the temptation of sin. We need to move from constantly just trying to stay away from being sinners to I am convinced of his love. I'm convinced of something and it's driving me to find the depths and the heights and how wide and how deep this love is. And you don't have to tell somebody that is in love with God pursuing his grace to be balanced and make sure you got enough legalism so you're not a bad boy. Religion tells you, listen, don't get too close because you're dirty. And for too long, revival has been a a, uh, an announcement that you're dirty, come get right with God, but it's not biblical. You can't get right with God. God became a man, and God made you right with God. Are you guys with me? Yes. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> it's the young ones, man. I want my kid growing up saying things like, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I don't even want to, I'm not going to teach him, listen, you don't have to fight against the world. You just walk, everywhere you go, the kingdom of God goes. We say here all the time, I want our children to be able to say, we were born in Zion. All we knew is that our clothes grew on us, our shoes grew on our feet, everything was a miracle. Our life was a miracle. And for too long, religion has lied to you to tell you that, listen, if you just mingle a little bit of law in there, if you just work a little bit harder, if you just maybe fast for 38 more days, if you pray for, you know, like my, my uncle, Pastor Benny, who's gonna be with us tomorrow night, it's gonna be amazing. He would pray for eight hours a day. And I, I went through this season where I'm like, I know how to get more anointed. I'll pray for nine. <laughs> and then I'll fast every other day. And I did it, and honestly, you know what I found? I found a lot of condemnation in that season. And, and I could say, I was, I was with the Lord, I was like doing all the stuff, I'm pacing, and my mind's wandering, I'm like, I'm just gonna pray in the spirit for 16 hours, and the, and the Lord is like, hey, remember your kids? Hey, remember your marriage? But Lord, no, 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 I can't be loved to them because I have to love you and no one's watching. Benny spent eight hours, I need to spend nine so I can carry it on, you know? And, and all I found was condemnation until the Lord came into my life and I realized that in the midst of doing ministry, in the midst, I mean, there would be seasons where if I passed somebody in a wheelchair and didn't pray for them, I couldn't sleep for five days. I was so condemned. I walked around condemned and I thought it was obedience. But good works flow from Christ who is in me. And I had one mission tonight, and it's not to make you scream and shout and get us zealous. It's that you leave going, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am his habitation. I am the place that he desires. Psalms 87 says that Zion will be called his favorite place on earth. That's what I pray over this place all the time, this corporate place, that God, this would be your favorite place on earth, and that my love for you, I used to be obedient because I, was, I had to be a good boy, but when you actually start being obedient because you're in love, the strength of grace will carry your life into going, I used to have to try hard, and what used to be hard to overcome, like, you know, you watch pornography on your laptop, and, and you can't get away from it, and this is, this is something that I guarantee you messes with many people in this room. Just statistically, it messes with many people in this room. And I don't think we have a sin problem. I think we have a believing in his presence problem. Because if my natural dad, if your natural dad is in the room, you're not gonna open the laptop and watch anything. But what about God, who Jesus didn't say, when you pray, pray my father. He said, when you pray, pray our father who art in heaven. And then he goes on, he says, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. He wants earth to look like heaven. And how he's going to do it is he's going to raise children that have this in their mouth. I have a father who I am just exactly like. I want to look like him. I want to walk like him. I want to talk like him. I want to bear his name. I don't just want his benefits. I don't just want what he can give me. I don't want to just have the nice encounter. And we live off of 16-year-old encounters, and that's all we talk about. We talk about the years ago when he touched me. But God is a God that wants to abide with you. He wants you to start looking like him. You are the habitation of God. And we would cheap you out. We would make this cheap to make it anything other then God is looking for a wife. You are, I mean, the implications that we are going to marry, do you realize you're gonna marry God? Just think on that for five minutes. Marry God. What is the implication of marrying God? My wife is not dirty. She's my bride. If anything, she far exceeded the list that I made. Me, not so much. He's coming for a spotless, pure bride. And what religion has made that be is bite your tongue a little bit harder and don't be dirty. Rather than going, I am pure. I am holy as God is holy. This is in the Bible. But religion somewhere along the way said, stay on this side of the river, it's safer. And I'm sick of it. I'm not gonna stay on this side of the river anymore. I wanna actually believe what the scriptures tell me I can be because I'm telling you, these little eight-year-olds, when they start coming into this, they're actually gonna believe the things like lay your hands on the sick and the sick will recover. They're going to actually start believing that, that they, that, listen, raising the dead in scripture, do you know that it's an elementary principle? Anyone seen the dead raised? I haven't. I've tried. Didn't work. No one, no one's, we don't see, and today that's like the pinnacle of Christianity. Man, if you raise the dead, mega ministry overnight, done. We put it on Instagram. We want everybody to see. It's not really about the Lord. It's about what you did what you think you did. Paul says, do we have to go back? Paul's such a beast. Do we, do we have to go back to the elementary principles of raising the dead? Paul, what in God's name are you talking about? Raising the dead, elementary? What's, what's high school? in the kingdom of God? What's college like in the kingdom of God? But somewhere along the way, religion told me it doesn't, it's, it's a 50-50 chance. Men building re- doctrines around healing isn't for today because they prayed for someone and they built something of their weakness rather than, no, 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 the gospel is you have to die. He didn't refurbish you, he killed you. He didn't, he didn't like, we're, we're battling. We, we always say, and, I'm, and I get it, I get it. We're, you know, we're going back to the beginning. But I'm not going back to Adam. I, I'm not even going back to the garden with Adam. I'm going into a city called God is here. Revelation 21 is that there is a city coming down from heaven adorned as a bride. And we will hear the angels singing that God and man are tabernacled together. That's what we built this off of is that I am longing to see that day. In my day is a voice crying out that God and man are tabernacled together on the earth. I want my children to believe it. And we've cheaped you out for too long telling you that it's not possible, telling you you gotta be careful You can't say you're not a sinner. I'm gonna say that I'm not a sinner every single day of my life. And you can try to kick me out all you want. Listen, I have a microphone. So (laughs) if you leave or you stay, what we say here is it says our house for him, not a house for people. So I know we love people, of course. 
But our first priority is, is that God finds something attractive on the earth. And that's not a beautiful building. It's a bunch of people that go, hey, I believe you. I actually believe the cross. And you look in the mirror and you see all the things you've done. It's not about what you've done. Don't spit on the blood of Jesus and say, I said yes to Jesus, but I'm still Adam. You have to decide. Who do you believe in more, Adam or Jesus? You are the habitation of God. And I think we just don't consider that enough. That I am the place that God said, I'm gonna take the tabernacle, I'm gonna take the the bread, the table of showbread, I'm gonna take the altar of incense, the candlestick, and I'm gonna call you the light of the world. I'm gonna tell you to eat me like you're eating bread. And I'm gonna take the whole thing and I'm gonna put it inside of you. And we're not gonna travel. I'm not gonna have to to hold sticks on my shoulders anymore. I'm gonna walk around as the whole thing, including the holy place. If God lives in me, where would he meet the priest at? In the holy place. You are God's tabernacle in the earth. And we're just trying to get through work. We're just trying to make it through our eight to five and trying not to be angry with our children, and one day I'm gonna make it to heaven. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is not even to just stay burning until he comes back. The parable of the talents was you have to multiply. We need the expansion of God's glory in the earth. Can you guys help me out behind me? The Lord was very clear, extremely clear with me, that this is what, and again, I'm not, I know that it's all about Jesus. But if someone came into my home and they sat on my couch, my wife was sitting next to me, and they just said how amazing I was, and she would try to say something and they would completely ignore her. And she was serving them and she was helping them and and they didn't even consider that she was present. What would I do as a father? What would I do as a husband? I'd be like, hey, hold on. Have you met my wife yet? She cleaned this house for you. She set it up for you. She cooked. She cleaned. She did all these things. You haven't even looked at her. And I think, I, again, I know the heart is right in that it's just about Jesus, but I think Jesus is saying, and I'm all about you. Yeah. Otherwise, why did he come? Why did he die? Why did he give his life? He didn't die for himself. You're a part of this story, and I'm not gonna stand up here and allow religion to write you out of it any longer. The case is closed, Romans 8 says, fashion, and there remains no accusing voice of condemnation. Come on. Eric got into Romans 6, 7, and 8. You got to read it all together. I love that he did it together. People are stuck. Listen, Romans 6 says it like six times. You are set free from sin. You know what that means in the Greek? Free. You have been set free from sin. Some of you don't believe it because you love your sin. You just stay in it. But when you're set free from it, you can't find it anymore. You're free from it, right? You don't want to go back to it. Like what if, what if God actually changes our desires like we heard this morning and, and the things that used to grab hold of us don't grab hold of us anymore? I mean, how many of you can attest to like you were an alcoholic and then even the smell of it today causes you to go, I, don't, I can't even be in the same room as it. You know what that's called? You know what that's called? That's called grace. It's not a license to sin. It's like a dirty word in church. Paul shows up and said, who lied to you? You got to mingle law and grace. You're not drinking the alcohol because you're stuck in the law or you're not drinking it because your desires have changed. There's only one that can save you and it's grace. It says you nullify grace. Eric read it today. You know what that word nullify means? You violate the grace of God. That's what that word means. You violate it. You violate the grace of God thinking that you can add to it by your works. That's unbelievable. Romans 6, you, can, you are set free. 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 And then you get, hold on, and then you get to Romans 7 and everyone's confused. Paul didn't write chapters. 
Paul wrote a letter. And he says, it says it right there, but to them who are under the law, what you want to do, you can't do. You're always confused. You're walking in a circle. You hate yourself. You think you're disgusting. You call it being poor in spirit. I want you to be very clear about something. When Corey's going after being poor in spirit, it's not thinking some horrible thing of yourself. It's realizing that you had to die and your life is hidden in Christ with God. Poor in spirit is remaining outside of the violation of grace. That God, it's your grace that binds my body together. God, it's your grace that causes me to walk in holiness. But here's the problem. I used to aim at holiness and I never found it. But when I started aiming at union with God, all of a sudden I started walking in holiness and I wasn't trying anymore. So Romans 7, what you will to do, you can't do. You want to do this, but you just, you're conf- you are a confused person. Bunch of disgusting sinners, basically is what it says, but to them who are under the law. And then he gets to chapter 8, the next part of the letter, but now. Everyone say, but now. You know what now means in the Greek? It means now. Isn't that crazy? But we think one day when we die and go to heaven, but that's not in the Bible. (laughs) But now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he came and he gave his only God's son that through him we might have eternal life. You know what 17 says? And he did not come to condemn the world. Jesus is the type of of God that catches a woman in adultery. In the very act, it said, they throw her, the religious ones, the righteous ones, the good boys, throw her at his feet, starts writing in the sand. This probably isn't biblical. I just like to think about this, that maybe he started writing like their sins in the sand. start walking away because he says he who has no sin cast the first stone it's just an idea and he's left alone with her he says I don't condemn you you see people get nervous when you talk like this because they're like oh my god they're gonna sin and then they're gonna think it's okay no no no. it's this that draws you it woos you to loving him it's his goodness that leads us to repentance not telling people they're gonna burn in hell for 68 years but that's what revival's been is let's, here, here's what we'll do. We'll call success just seeing if people run to an altar because they're petrified. Where did that come from? Hell, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. We had our protesters here, praise God. And uh, <laughs> Benny Hinn, man, criminal family, I think is what it says. Poor Benny, he's not even here yet, you know? Um, those same guys go to Todd's and do the same thing. I, and so they had this sign that said, Todd White, hell awaits you. And uh, very sweet, kind people. And Todd and I one time talked about, what if we put sprinklers just right now? Uh, we really did have that conversation. And then we were like, no, we can't. We got to be loving. Um, but I remember one time I was preparing for a Sunday. And... At this time in my life, I hadn't, I hadn't gotten gripped with this message of it's by his grace. And I was incredible at scaring the actual hell out of people. Not cussing, not, I mean literally. I, I, was, I was very good at scaring people into saying yes for Jesus because it made me feel good when I had another person to say that they came to an altar call and prayed a prayer even though you don't see even that in the Bible, right? So, so we build numbers, and, and you know you're not going to stand before God and say, I got a million saved. It says that we would give an account for our life. That word account means divine expression. He's going to look for himself. Right? So I remember I'm studying, and, and this sign kept coming up in my mind, Todd White, hell awaits you. And I'm like, why? Uh, why? And so I'm rebuking the devil, and you know. <laughs> We rebuke the devil even though he's been defeated for 2,000 years. I always found that interesting. But anyway, um, so I'm like, I can't figure out why I'm thinking, keep seeing this. And the Lord speaks to me and he says, you know, you're so bothered with them. Even though you go up on Sunday and wave the same sign, hell awaits you. Run to an altar and pray a prayer. The sign should say he loves us. 
Oh, how he loves us. And here's what I'm after. I'm after a bunch of prodigal sons. It wasn't a prodigal sinner, it was a son. A bunch of prodigal sons that come and they run to him. Now the prodigal son, he had his religious thing ready. He had his note cards. He had prepared a whole thing. I know I'm not, I'm not worthy to be your son. This is what he said, I'm not worthy to be your son, so make me a servant. Just make me like the servants. And the father doesn't even respond to him. He starts kissing him everywhere. This is what altar calls should be like. Not me, not me. The Lord, the Lord. Someone's gonna clip that. It's gonna be a big problem. I'm married, I love my wife with all of my heart. But the picture, the picture, the father, listen. I really, the anointing's gone, it left. Left. The picture is this, ready? The father sitting on his rocking chair, waiting. He's sitting there waiting for his boy. And he just sees him in the distance and he doesn't even wait, he starts running after him. He doesn't, he, he doesn't even ask him, what'd you do? What'd you spend the money on? What did you waste? Come on, let's go get a spank. He starts screaming as he's running. Get the ring, get the robe, make a feast, my son. Everyone say, my son. My son, my son, my son is home. He looks disgusting. He was sleeping with pigs, and he doesn't even care. He starts kissing him all over the place. The son says, okay, okay, this is what we do. Okay, I know you love me. I know it's by your grace. I know it's your blood, but, but let me add to your blood by telling you what's wrong with me. He starts doing the rehearsed thing. The father didn't say, thank you for your apology. He didn't say, that's profound. He ignored him and he kept yelling, get the ring and the robe. The son is like, I'm not worthy to be a son. But you don't have the right to qualify or disqualify yourself because you didn't hang on a tree. Your blood wasn't shed for you. Jesus's was. So don't despise the cross and say silly Christian things that take you out of the story. We got to stop being crabs that pull each other down and call it humility. God is looking for a generation that would dare to believe I was born for the other side of the river. And here's my inheritance. I am his inheritance. That's what Ephesians 1 says, that we would come to the knowledge of the inheritance of the saints in Christ Jesus. Jesus. What is the hope of his calling? He goes as far as saying, before the foundation of the world, we were chosen in him. This is unbelievable. And here's the implication. He knew exactly what you were going to do. He knew that you would leave him. He knew that you would sin against him. And he just waits. And he just waits. And he waits. And he waits. And you didn't find him. He then, he found you. He went that far. And he goes, remember. Remember the glory we had before the foundation of the world. Everyone in the world comes from God. And until you meet him, until you encounter him, until you touch your beginning, people will think that they're depressed. They'll think they're discouraged. They'll think that, that they're suicidal. They'll, and people fill their lives with drugs. They fill their lives with alcohol. They fill their lives with all the stuff of the world because there's this thing in them that can't be filled unless they go back to the beginning. My heart tonight was not that we just say, wow, that was a powerful meeting. I want you to be driving back to your home or hotel or whatever you're doing, and I want tears to be flowing down your eyes saying, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God, you look at me and you say, wow. I know that I'll get in trouble for this. Preachers will get mad at me for this. You're just talking about yourself. You're talking about people. Well, I haven't said one thing that's not in the Bible. I'm gonna, without being ashamed of the gospel in any way, shape, or form, we have to be able to say that as he is, so are we in this world. If we're actually gonna build a habitation for God, God isn't living in some Motel 6 
trashed out, God made you the mansion for his presence. God said, I am going to find a worthy house to live in. See, this kindness, it causes, you're not going to go home and sin. You're thinking to yourself, you love me like that. You care for me like that. Even while I was a sinner, you said, oh, you were the joy that was set before me. Sheesh. So why don't you stand with me? I do believe God wants to mark many of us tonight. But I didn't just want to move with the Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit came to remind me of Jesus. It's spirit and it's truth. I thought about just doing kind of what we always do and do Psalms 132 and get them hyped about David and hyped about killing their giants. But I think the biggest giant we need to kill is the one between our ears. This this imbalance, this what am I and who am I and what am I going to accomplish and what's my destiny and what's my prayer? I'm just doing good to have a full night's sleep. Some of you struggle sleeping at night. And what God is saying is that is not your lot because that's not who you are. So come on, let's welcome the Lord. And if some of you guys that came up, just scoot back just a little bit because I want to do something. You don't have to go back to your seats, just scoot back just a little bit. If while I was ministering, your heart was shaking specifically, for you haven't known God this way. Maybe you don't know the Lord at all. Maybe you came here having no idea who Jesus is, or maybe you've left your first love. But you know within your heart that you have worked hard to be right before the Lord, and you have been dealing with condemnation, you have been dealing with shame. You've been dealing with fear, anxiety. I want you to come and join me in the front. And we're gonna do this the right way. Come on, come and join me in the front. We're gonna do this the right way. Come and really give your life to this one who's gonna say, come get your ring and your robe tonight. Come on, come get your ring and your robe. crisis within our generation, Lord. People questioning their sexuality, we command alignment in your mind now. In Jesus' mighty name. He didn't make a mistake. <laughs> he didn't mess up. He didn't give you no tendencies. He made you perfectly as he desired. Any tendencies you think you have, you created. So I want you in your own way. I'm not going to lead you through some religious repetition, repeat. I want you in your own way, out loud, to say, God, I receive you as my father. And I thank you that I look like you. Don't pray my prayer. I want you to pray yours out loud. The rest of you, stretch your hands and pray for them in the spirit. Come on. Out loud. Just on the instruments. Just on the instruments. Come on. God, I pray that you capture the young people in this room, that you capture Gen Z, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. You will never look like the world. We've come to divorce the world and say yes to this God, to this God who's saying, come get your ring and your robe. And do not allow religion any longer to set up boundaries and restrictions. You were born for the other side of the river. Your inheritance is Christ in you. Your inheritance is the power of God flowing through your veins. Come on, pray in the spirit out loud. Don't just watch. 
Get involved, get involved. You that came up, just give your life to Jesus. The real man, not the one mingled with law, not the one mingled with religion, not just some theory and thought, but a real man who's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Fill them, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Fill them with your kindness. Fill them with your mercy, Jesus. Fill them, God, with your power, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Fill them with your kindness, Lord. Fill her, Jesus. I thank you for anxiety and fear, depression. I thank you for it all being gone now in Jesus' mighty name. God says your name is Hephzibah. God delights in you. God delights in you. habitation of God. You are the habitation of God. You are the habitation of God. And you are worthy enough to be the habitation of God. Because God became a man. And God bled. And God was beaten. And God was bruised. Because you were the joy that was set before him. Every voice, every voice, every voice, every voice. I thank you for freedom. Freedom now is Come here. Come on. Sing. Freedom in Jesus' mighty name. Be free. Be free. Be free. For your majesty. Oh uh-huh.
Go stand right here. Let your spirit, God, break out in Bakersfield. Come on. Let your spirit, God, break out in Bakersfield. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. What they've longed to see, God, you're saying, I will do through you. Stop waiting. Just do it. It's time to believe. It's time to go. It's time to run. You were born for the other side of the river. It's time to run. It's time to run. God, fill them with your fire, Lord. The courage and the boldness. In Jesus' name. shaking on the inside of you just lift your hand come on God wants to touch you and God wants to change everything God wants to change everything he'll do it in a moment ask him ask him you don't need me to lay hands on you just ask him to do it ask him to do it ask him he'll do it you want God to lay hands on you, trust me. You want God to lay hands on you. Ask Him to touch you, ask Him to touch you. No more anxiety, come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, that you touch our dancers. Come here, Jenna. Touch our dancers, God. Bring it to you. Come here. Fill them, Lord, with your fire and your power, God. Don't look around. Just pray. We just want him to come. Just pray in the spirit. Go on, every single person. Elena, come here. Elena, come here. Come here. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for the prophetic gift, God, erupting out of our life. Prophetic gift, God, erupting out of our life. Cameron, stretch your hands towards your wife. Stretch your hands towards her. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, God, for the prophetic gift, God, coming out of her life. 
Thank you for our students, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you fill them, that you fill them, Lord. That you fill her, God. That the word about the womb was first for you. That you impregnate, God, a generation with such fire, with such courage. People told you you had to be quiet. God, I thank you for fiery women. God, filling this house with the word of God in their mouth. The prophetic word, God, being uttered through their lives and their children. Close your eyes, lift your hands. Too many of you are looking around. Just ask him to come. He says, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. Jesus, Jesus, Father. Come on, let him have you. Just let him have you. Let him have you. Let him have you. God, more, more than I, more for you, more for you, more for you, more for you.
Pastor, come here. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for touching our team, God. God. I thank you for the scribes, Lord. Accept it in the beloved. It doesn't matter what anyone said. It's what he said. Lord, I thank you that you come as a father, Lord. Stretch your hands. Stretch your hands. Just don't, just hold strong. Don't fall. so shocked with what comes out of your mouth you're gonna scare yourself with your zeal and your passion for too long you thought maybe I'm just supposed to be the supporting pastor's wife but publicly Lord is announcing to you today that you will stand beside Costa and you will preach the gospel and you will sing again God I thank you for our commissioning tonight of my brother and my sister Lord Time to step fully in to the anointing that's on their lives. We receive Costi as Pastor Costi. He's a seated pastor here at this house. Thank you, God. Everything changes today. Everything changes, God, today. Everything, God, changes today. Spirit of revelation. Shock him, Lord. Shock him, Lord. A father, a true father, a true father. You are holy.
Lord, we receive your kindness tonight. How you would come and tackle us with your love. Let the weight of your glory, God, fill us to full. Where's Landry at? Costi and Pastor Costi and Tanner, put your hands on them. The leader of our youth. Get him, God. Get him, Lord. Shake everything he thought. Ephesians 3 says that we may comprehend with all the saints. What is the width, the length, the height, the depth to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge? That word knowledge means science. In other words, that we have an encounter with God that science cannot explain. So Landry, stop explaining it away. It's impossible. Lord, I thank you for the fire of your spirit, God, to go through him and hit every single kid, God, that he comes in contact with, Lord. God, I thank you that the youth, God, that you're raising in this house, Lord. God says, I picked the right man. I picked the right man. I didn't pick you. God picked you. I thank you that he started believing God fully, fully. Fill him, God. Fill him, God. Fill him, Lord. Thanks for that weight that he's been experiencing only get heavier until it absolutely crushes him just let it crush you a generation needs it a generation needs it just last thing lift your hands for your kids if you have kids lift your hands for your kids leaders fire of God go through them Lord oh. you've been so faithful you've been so faithful you've been so faithful God's man God's woman not my pick, but God's pick. God, I thank you that you're raising up an army through these two. Not only in their house, God, but many, many, many sons and daughters, Lord. Many, Lord, will come and they will say, we just want to learn and sit at your feet. Just show us how to love him the way that you do. Why do you have the joy that you have? It's time for you guys to fully step in. Fully step in. To what it means to be a father and what it means to be a mother. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. A new day. A new mantle for a new day, a new mantle for a new day. So come on, lift your hands for your kids. God, we thank you for our children, Lord, being born in Zion. And we speak over a generation, your name will not be ben Onai, but your name will be Benjamin. And while the world tries to create this narrative that it's gonna get darker and darker and darker, we say over our homes, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That as for me and my house, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as far as I'm concerned, the scriptures say that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. I thank you, Lord, that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom 
of our God and His Christ. And how you're going to do it, God, is you're going to do it through our children and their children and their children. I break every generational curse inside of this room, God. And I thank you that you're raising up fathers and mothers that are saying from this point forward, only blessing, only power, and only anointing over our children. Protect them and keep them from the systems of this world. Thank you, God, for William and Ellie and Benjamin, Lord, and Bethany. May they all, God, go further than we could ever think or imagine. Tonight was about this one thing, changing the trajectory from just making it until we get to heaven to, oh, how close he wants to come now. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We break every boundary and every rule religion told me I had to follow. We believe, God, that as you are, so are we in this world. We believe, God, this Habitation 23, that we are the habitation of God on the earth, and we are not ashamed. What a privilege, God, it was to lose my life and to find yours. What a privilege, God, to be crucified with you, to die with you, to be buried with you, to be raised with you and seated with you in heavenly places. This is unbelievable, Jesus, that you made this possible. That I didn't have to feel the pain, that I didn't have to feel the nails. That blood didn't drip all over my body, but it dripped all over yours. And you said, what happened to me happened to you. This is unbelievable, Jesus. We're here to say thank you. What a privilege to be the habitation of God. We didn't deserve it for a second. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we never leave the simple gospel. The lamb and the lamb's wife. And we're excited to marry you, God, fully on that day. We love you deeply, Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, everybody said amen. amen. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. Come on, something he's worthy of. Something he's worthy of. fun the Lord is so good we're coming back tomorrow morning my dad is gonna be here and uh, I would encourage you if you never heard Cedo you probably want to be here in the morning your whole life is gonna get flipped upside down and then we'll help you put the pieces back together we'll flip you right side up but tomorrow morning 10 30 a.m service starts the doors will open at 9 30 and then tomorrow night my uncle pastor benny will be with us i would really encourage you so service starts at six o'clock tomorrow night it's our last service of the conference get here as early as possible that night um he has a knack for drawing crowds so um but i want this group especially our church community to be in this room i feel like the lord is going to release something generational amen so i love you guys hug on somebody before you leave um, if you're encountering the Lord, you can hang for a bit eventually and Usher will wake you up. We'll see you guys in the morning. <laughs>